Welcome back to Gold Derby. I'm Christopher Rosen. I'm joined by Joyce Ng. And Joyce, it's time for another mailbag episode. Our third one. We made it to three. Are we going to keep track of every one we do? Before well, like, we if we're going to do it indefinitely, there's no reason to. <laughs> so, uh, as always, you can email us at slugfest at goldderby.com, and then we'll read your emails. So that's what we're going to do here. We have so many, Joyce, from a lot of our regs and some new people, which I Ooh. love. Uh, first one, though, is from KM, who we've heard from a lot. Very short. Nice. Hi, Joyce I love and Chris. the short ones. I love it. Hi, Joyce and Chris. What do you think of the prospects for juror number two to make it into best picture or any category for that matter? Um, well, juror number two is my favorite John Grisham adaptation of 2024. Like I, just pure 90s vibes. <laughs> already like saving a spot in my top five list for juror number two. Under, understandably so, I feel like. Clint doing a courtroom drama. Totally pulpy premise. I love pulp. What if you vehicular manslaughtered somebody a year ago mm -hmm. and then the next year got a jury duty notice for a vehicular manslaughter murder case and you were on the jury of the man accused of the crime you committed? Mm -hmm. Ten stars. Uh, no notes. Absolutely perfect. So... Uh, um, and then you have a, a about a boy reunion. Yes. So, like can't go wrong with that. So Nick Holt is the juror, the man who maybe uh, committed a, a major crime. A big year for him. He's also in Nosferatu as the cuck, I believe, to Dracula. I think that's the character name. Uh, and then Tony Collette is the prosecutor, Joyce. Mm -hmm. Who's going to be yelling at him once he gets, comes, I'm sure he's going to come forward, right? And you know, have a he big conversation. Be with like, her? um, like, like Peter Sarsgaard in Presume Innocent. Yeah, I hope this ends with like Peter Sarsgaard rolling in like Sam Jackson at the end of Avengers and being like, "You're part of a much bigger world now." Uh, Kiefer Sutherland looks like he's just doing a few good men in the trailer. I don't know. Great. Um, uh, there's also J.K. Love J.K. J.K. Simmons. Yep. Uh, your fave, Chris Messina. Yeah, and I, um, I interviewed him mm -hmm. last year in December for our fave air last year. And he was in the final week of production on this at that time when we were talking. So we talked more offline about it, but he was just raving about it and just, you know, obviously working with Clint and everything and uh, loved the whole experience. So this movie comes out, I think November 1st in limited release. Is that right? It's also going to be at AFI. And it, I think it's closing AFI. Uh -huh. uh, not taken seriously really for anybody as an Oscars contender. I feel like um, in terms of the Oscars, people have been kind of slowly going off of Clint with his last couple of films um, that have failed to yield a, a ton of Oscar nominations, save for Kathy Bates for Richard Jewell. And so yeah. this one was like Tony Collette Oscar nominee for this. Yeah, a lot of people had her in like months ago in Supporting Actress. And sight unseen, and with the way that category has shaken out, still has to be considered a potential oh, contender, yes. like mm -hmm. for the fifth spot. I'd also say for me, and like you said, it looks amazing. Totally our shit, right? Like, you know we're going to like this. Uh, if, if it's good, like we've said this many times, the bottom of that best picture field is very loose. So if it's good and it's like a return to form for Clint and people just happen to like it, I actually don't think it's impossible to imagine it gets in, especially because Warner Brothers now has Dune Part 2, period. What, what did you say a couple of weeks ago? Their slate has a, a clarified. Clarified. Yeah. So it's clarified to just Dune. So now they have room maybe for juror number two to be like the movie that maybe people are excited by. That said, it does look pretty broad, but I don't know. I'm not counting it out completely. No. Um, yeah, like it could hit, um, not just with the public, but with voters. You just never know. So gold, its path is like, like, I don't know. I don't think it'll be like American Sniper. <laughs> no, I don't think so either. But its path is like an AFI top 10 citation. Like an uh, NBR. NBR for sure. And then like a Golden Globe nominee or two. Yeah. What if Nick gets in 
and we could. There's six lots. We have talked about this. There's so many. No, I mean, like at the Oscars too. Five. Well, he could <laughs> because that category is very loose. We well, we have a couple emails later about like uh, a complete unknown and stuff. That trailer came out this week. We both saw Queer, and mm-hmm. now uh, uh, we've talked about this. Uh, not not representing Daniel Craig in my picks. I don't know about you. No, we both replaced them with uh, Seb for the Imagine Apprentice. Stan for the Apprentice, who also has a different man which has seemingly gotten like a little elbowed out by the several other A24 movies. Mm -hmm. But Apprentice, who knows how that plays out because of the actual presidential election, which I think will have a major factor on how it does. It's out today as you're watching this Friday, tomorrow as we're recording this. Um, uh, Yeah. um, You know, I feel like that movie will be probably more supported by voters and the industry than by the general public uh, and especially the internet and social media, which is way more reactive and binary about things. Yeah, I I know a lot of critics did not think it was good or kind of just wrote it off. And it Mm. felt like- It's a good film. I think it's really good. I saw it twice because the first time I saw it, I was uh, head bobbing because it was very late at night. So I'm- I I had a I had a, a link for it because there was an issue at my screening for it and I got ten views and I I watched it multiple times so I didn't watch mine I got a link for it too because I had already seen it and I was like I heard uh, that you maybe have links because of our I didn't say I don't know who told me <laughs> you aren't the only person I know who got a link for it and uh, then I watched it again and I was like this is good. it's just really good it's just like a really good movie yeah and and Seb and Jeremy good. are really good so so good so I was like if he gets in that's great but like we said there's a lot of all uh exterior uh factors into what will play into that campaign so maybe Nick Holt gets in he could easily also get in at SAG because I actually don't know what that's gonna look like and I could see well I never had Daniel in at SAG anyway Same. even before I saw queer. Yes. So. yes. so you could have John David Washington at SAG. I think I might have Glenn Powell now at SAG. Of course you is, do. Well, they nominated Sandler, so that's my thing. But I was like, what if it's Nick Holt for this? I mean, there's definitely an open space there. At least one, maybe two, if complete unknown uh, isn't as good as people are hoping. I haven't really um, investigated the reactions to the trailer this week. Well, so. I, I followed the Searchlight Twitter account and... Uh, mm-hmm. They a lot of praise they found. So well, I mean, like obviously, like the Timmy Sands love it. I, they retweeted one person who said they were a Bob Dylan scholar and was like, "This is like a dead on accurate representation of Bob Dylan." So who knows? Sure. Uh, anyway, com- juror number two, I'm way in. Uh, can't wait to see this movie. I already know, like, you, just you know, it's gonna be like I'm in. Like, this is good. It's gonna be great. It's gonna be uh, a movie. It's a, a movie, movie movie. That's what I call them, movie movies. That's a movie movie. Uh, as always, Cam, thank you for the email. Uh, this one's from Champ Reviewer, who actually emailed us last week. I didn't get to his email, and now it's at, oh, I'm just moving on because we have a new wow. one. Wow. They, they emailed, really? they emailed about Blitz, Joyce, which we extensively oh, well, yeah, we, talked we couldn't, about. We couldn't answer it last week because we can't, we couldn't talk about Blitz before the right. embargo. So now we've talked about it, and you can watch that right now if you wanted to. Don't watch it yet, but after this, you can go watch it. We talked all about Blitz for like 30 minutes. Uh, so champ, if you want to watch that, that's great. But now you're back with another email that I'll happily read. Hi, Joyce and Chris. I have enjoyed your podcast on award shows, specifically the Oscars. One content, one potential contender for the Oscars in 2025 is the piano lesson. This is another August Wilson play adaptation with Denzel Washington producing and his son, Malcolm directing. We have seen previous August Wilson adaptations do well at the Oscars. Fences was nominated for four awards, winning one for Viola Davis' performance, and Ma Rainey's Black Bottom was nominated for five awards, winning two. There are current talks that I have heard about the film is Danielle Deadweiler's performance. After she was infamously not nominated for her performance in Till, is it possible she could finally receive her first Oscar nomination? If that does happen, do you see her winning as a way for voters to acknowledge their mistake? Thank you for reading. That's from Champ. Um, hilarious. Their mistake. Um... Probably the people who didn't vote for her don't view that as a mistake. No. So. <laughs> Have the people who didn't vote for her ever seen Till? Probably not. And I think that's kind of the the divide here, maybe. Like, I still have her getting in. I think you do, too. Mm-hmm. Oh, Duncan. Oh, my God. I should go. Sponsored this podcast runs on Duncan, if anybody wants. When, when are we going to get our spawn con for Duncan? Duncan, hate us up. Oh, my God. Okay. So... 
Um, what was I saying? Oh, we both have her in. Yeah, so. I have her in second, actually. So. And yeah, so I think like uh, people like Champ mm-hmm. and like Film Twitter and like any uh, Till stands or Danielle Detweiler stands uh, are really hoping for this nomination for her. And she's really good in the film. She is. Um, I would like the best performance in the film for sure. And uh, so, yeah, they, they won this nomination for her and obviously to make up for the Till snub. Mm-hmm. as well and i think a lot of the logic behind that too because they want her to get in so badly is that you try to justify by saying like uh voters will try to make up for that snub and but i'm just like you know to play devil's advocate like what you were saying before like that any of people who didn't vote for like watch till and like probably not like it's not like she w- like Till did really well and she was like a shocking snub you know like Amy Adams for Arrival or something you know so it got no nominations it was pretty weak throughout the season and I don't think like voters it's not just with her but with like anyone who was snubbed like I don't think they think that way and they don't feel incentivized that way like they just move on like they're not stands online who are just al- always rooting for their fave right you know uh a couple things there a i agree with that yes and uh i would say not just because it's not because the till this is not a knock on till but with these stream when it's just i personally think this if it's a streaming oscar movie that was like a it's an it was an mgm right amazon mgm mm-hmm. release so it had a theatrical component and then it ends up on prime as like a streaming tile movies like that that are not going to make money at the box office and then go to streaming and then have no cable visibility at all they might as well not no this is not just tell but they might as well not even exist to me because there's no way you're watching you know it's like a lot of like imagine if you were 20 years ago maybe she gets snubbed for till and then it's on hbo or tnt or wherever it is and you're flipping around and you're like oh man this is great i wish i would have watched this right and now it's like you already ignored the movie and it's now just lost in a tile of a thousand other tiles it doesn't exist like you're never going to go back and watch it and you're never even going to find it by accident so i feel like you're right like in terms of like they don't really care that she was snubbed they didn't nominate her and then never thought about this movie again yeah like if she gets nominated for a piano lesson it's not gonna have anything to do with her till snub correct like they've moved on from that (laughs) now piano lesson is on netflix so that gets a leg up because everyone has netflix and will be widely promoted and probably widely watched especially by the right people whereas till i don't think was the funny thing reading that email where it's like oh fences got all these nominations ma rainey obviously got more nominations my personal thought was like Piano Lesson is better than both of those movies. And I actually think she might just be the only nominee for the movie based on how this year has turned out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And like Ma, Ra- Ma Rainey funny. also was was snubbed in Best Picture when it was still the flex scale. Yes. So, um, yeah, I think Piano Lesson is definitely the most cinematic, cinematic of the August adaptations mm-hmm. so far. And... Uh, yeah, it it really like if you're one of those people who thinks like certain like films adapted from plays like feel too the um like like a play. I was gonna say theatrical, but you know different meaning there. Meant. I knew. What you but meant. like this one, you know, really kind of opens up the space and the story. And there's obviously if you if you're familiar with the story, there's a supernatural component to it anyway. So yeah, it really opens up the film like that. So it it I guess it would it. <laughs> It feels like a movie in that way. Like, I don't think, yeah. I think there'll be fewer complaints that it feels like a play just on film. Like there are obviously extended scenes um, of dialogue that feel playish, but there's like, you know, a lot of other elements and like flashbacks that don't feel like a play. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, like, it, you know, we're saying like the lower tier of best picture is uh flexible so it's definitely possible there i just kind of feel like since it's been seen at festivals like it there's just been not a lot of buzz about it and i think that's that's an issue it's funny it's like i've not talked to actually one person who thought it was bad yeah but nobody is like like, no one's talking about it no one's talking about or enthusiastic about it i was my big takeaway was like oh i can't wait for malcolm washington's next movie i think he shows like a lot of promise here it's like really well made. I think that the supernatural elements are handled really well. Mm-hmm. She is great in the film. 
And I just think like she'll definitely, I, I have no, I honestly would be shocked if she, the category, it's not just because the category is weak, but I'm like, the category is weak. She's really good in the film. It's actually like a lead performance in a supporting category. I, it's on Netflix. So she'll get in at SAG. It might get a SAG ensemble nomination too. Like, I feel like she's just going to get in, but I don't know about the rest of the movie. I think picture could probably get in. Like we said, that's a flexible bottom. So if there is like a renewed bump yeah. after it's but on like, what, what what's its package with it? Is it just her? It's either just horror and picture or adapted screenplay too. Yeah, which like is adapted is is pretty empty. Right. So yeah. it's like it could be adapted screenplay, horror and picture. I I think because of the way some this year, while it's not the strongest of years, I think in the craft categories where it'd be like, oh, maybe like costumes or so. It's like there are just too many other yeah. like flashy contenders, or or makeup like if like uh, Ma Rainey got makeup. Obviously, I don't think this is gonna yeah and costumes right. Like this long. is not gonna get those. So, um, yeah. But, um, yeah. And then I think, you know, since it's been seen, um, is is Sam still in the top five or, is, or he's like, I mean, he was at, in first place for like two months I mean, is look. He in the top five or has he fallen out? Last like, time I looked, I thought he had fallen out. Let me look. He is fallen out. Okay. He is six behind Stanley Tucci. The top okay. five now are Kieran, Clarence Macklin, Guy Pierce, Denzel and Stanley Tucci. I have to tell you, I'm not super confident in Clarence Macklin either at this point. Uh, I have him in fourth and Jeremy in fifth, but if you told me like he missed, I would not be surprised. Um, yeah, well, like Sam is is good in the film, um, but he's, I don't think it's like something that is like undeniable either. I think people wanted this to be his competitive Oscar win. It, he's good in the film, but he's maybe the third best supporting actor in the film. No disrespect yeah. to Sam, but like Michael Potts and Ray Fisher, like I Ray think Fisher, are better. Yeah. So, and it's like, oh, okay, well, he's good. But like, these other guys are actually better. Yeah, Ray and then he fantastic. has a, he has a big monologue, but the way it's presented in the film um, doesn't really showcase him. Yes. Uh, it's very, I think it's a cool way to make the monologue work as a film, but it, yeah. if it's not a performance, it's not something that what you remember is, it's the way it's put together is really cool. But uh, the performance, it's like more like a narration in that case. Mm -hmm. Um, but a good movie. I think we both liked it. This one's from John, who emailed us at slugfest.goldderby.com. Hi, Joseph and Chris. Has it been long enough to reconsider pairing two younger actors to host the Oscars? The Anne Hathaway James Franco experiment was 14 years ago, and we later learned the latter was not up for the task. I've read the only murders in the building crew have been courted, so there'd be at least a millennial on stage with two baby boomers. Are there any other options for a younger team? That's from John and Olympia. You don't care about the host, Joyce, but I don't care about the host, but I don't think they would do that again. I I was listening to Kyle McCann on on the town with Matt Bellany, mm -hmm. which was good because Kyle knows what he's talking about. But it was, it was like me doing the Matt Damon. Do you have any idea how fucking easy this is with Bellany? Because he's like, what do you know about Enora? Uh, just like, OK, buddy. Uh, but anyway, in there, Kyle was like, they really need to ask these people like they don't ask the host early enough mm -hmm. and everybody is booked. So it's like you're not going to get Mulaney unless you know a year in advance. And even like you, Jackman and Ryan Reynolds, who obviously aren't millennials, but like would not do it probably because there's just not enough time. So I actually you know, have and no then, idea. Now, now he, he was busy again. You and know? so, and likely the murders people are busy. They're going to be shooting the next season. <laughs> so I have literally no idea what they're going to do for this. And I have no idea who they could even get, who would be somebody I think people would approve of and be interested in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And I, I think, I believe, like, James and Anne were booked, like, a couple months early. I, I want to say, like, November-ish. Yeah. Which is not, you know, like, January or anything. But, um, I mean, like, a couple times, I think they announced Jimmy Kimmel in November. So, like, that's okay. So, um, but that was also, this is also during a time when James Franco attended, like, 16 different colleges. You know, so yeah. he was busy in that sense. Yeah. Uh, I don't um, know who they will get to do it. I was like, I can't even imagine. I think like, I really don't have any idea, especially like, do they try to get like, I don't even know. Who would they get? Who could they possibly get? Who is affiliated with Disney and ABC? I, I don't know. This is why I don't care. I'm like, just tell me the winners. I don't care who's hosting the show. <laughs> like The Rock, they could just try that again. See if he'll do it. Even though he's busy as hell. Uh, I don't know. But I yeah, no I don't. I don't think they will go that route again, unless the like it's like a 
a duo that you you know works well together already. Right. I mean, you Jackman and Ryan Reynolds would have actually made a lot of sense. And and the, not, the Kyle's point was like if you announce them, you know, in March, then you have all like the whole Deadpool Wolverine press tour would have been like ask uh, like people asking them about what are they going to do with the Oscars, and all of a sudden it's like building buzz from July for the show that this year especially maybe will not have a lot of big ticket movies nominated. Whereas last year you had like Oppenheimer and Barbie. It's just bad producing or bad planning. Well, I don't, I mean, I'm sure, I think it's just a thankless job and they've gotten a lot of no's. I don't think they're not seeking people. Like we already know John Mulaney turned it down, you know? Right. So I think it's just hard finding people to say yes, even like they're just going down the, like they probably have a list and they're just going down it and everyone's just saying no. Well, two years ago, they, when they went down the list or was it two years ago, they ended up with Regina Hall and Amy Schumer. That, they, they announced that very late. Yeah, that was like, <laughs> we're just going to keep going down the list until somebody says yes. And then maybe all three of them said yes independently. And they were like, well, I guess they're doing it together. You know, that kind of thing. Why not? Uh, this one from Caleb Joyce. Emailed us at slugfestigolderby.com. Hi, Joyce and Chris. Sorry in advance for the long email. But Chris, please read through as I have a theory and I want you guys to entertain it. Three exclamation points. I looked at the awards calendar for this year and I realized that SAG and BAFTA are happening after final Oscar voting already closes. Usually one or both happen before or during Oscar voting. I do think the timeline of these award shows is important. For example, BAFTA happened a couple of days before Oscar voting began last year, and SAG happened a couple of days before Oscar voting closed. I think this helped Emma Stone win Best Actress, as she was the most recent winner of an industry award right before voting happened, and may have been given her a leg up on Lily in terms of momentum and recency bias. Lily's momentum at SAG was sort of a non-starter, since SAG happened a day or two before Oscar voting closed, and most people probably already cast their vote. This could also explain why the Oscars literally just copied and pasted BAFTAs last year. Even more evidence of this is the Everything Everywhere year, where Oscars copy and pasted all four SAG winners, since that was the most recent industry ceremony before Oscar voting opened. I bring this up because I suspect that the Golden Globes will have a big sway in who wins the acting categories. Critics' choice will just copy the Globes, and if there's no consensus frontrunner, SAG and BAFTA voters could default to the Globes as well. I want Mikey Madison to win more than anything, but I think it just makes sense that Carla will win comedy musical and Angie will win drama at the Globes. Since Amelia Perez is a stronger movie, I think Carla may just win Best Actress immediately starting my Mikey Madison comedy Golden Globe campaign right now. That's from Caleb. <laughs> uh, it makes sense to me. All this makes sense. Um, yeah, like this is, I don't think this is anything groundbreaking. Like I think most people kind of clock that, especially after BAFTA went eight for eight this past year after going oh for eight yes the year before yes and BAFTA was before SAG this past season so um to me I was like I think that's right on too in terms of like I, I could I think Carla could really run away with the best actress win personally right now I think it's between her and Angie and Mikey right that seems like the top three for most people I mean, like Mikey and Carla are the most likely to be nominated in Best Actress for sure. So like they're top two. And then, yeah, like unlike the last two years where we had the top two in different genres at the Globes, so they each won. And then they were going to face off in the other genre neutral categories of the other award shows. Um, Yeah, like the the wind path for one of them could be set in motion um, at the Globes. Because then it's like, they're not on even ground because the other person is not going to win drama, obviously. Right. So it will be like that winner versus whoever the drama winner is. So right. like the, the, the loser just shift down to third because they have no hardware from the Globes. Maybe. So, but, but yeah, the, the BAFTA ceremony is, occurs two days before Oscar voting closes, I believe. Um, so it's like, I don't, I don't think it's like they're like consciously paying attention to who is winning these awards Right. Like, I think a lot of like sometimes I I think some people have already voted before these awards have happened. Yes. You know, but I think that it's more. 
that like they're probably going to vote this way anyway and then but then like when we from the outside when we see it and we see the dates and how they line up we think it's reactive to the awards i i think it's a mix i personally think some of these people if they haven't voted will watch that and just be like oh what just won i'll vote for that person yeah and the other thing with sag like sag is gonna occur i think five days after uh, oscar voting closes but they also have a month of voting with sag for the yes. winners yes so i think that like so they like one person if you're a member of all three groups could be voting for the same people in the same films for all three yeah you know mm -hmm. but then it's a different body for each group so like your vote or the, the what you're voted for might not win at all three right uh, this one's from Raj. First time emailer, I believe. Hi, Joyce and Chris. This is Raj, cinephile and longtime fan of Gold Derby from India and now Phoenix, Arizona. I hope you're doing well. I want you to know that you're my favorite YouTube channel. Thank you for your amazing work. Here's my question. What do you think happened with Megalopolis? How could a director like Francis Ford Coppola not see what the general audience and most critics are now? Do you think it was his ego and or the fact that he's surrounded by a bunch of yes men that led to this disaster of a final product? Is this the worst, all caps, quote, passion project movie of all time? Lastly, do you think Francis Ford Coppola's recent, as in recent decades, work has tarnished his image? Are we ever taking his name in the same breath as Steven Spielberg or Stanley Kubrick? Sincerely yours, Raj. Um, I don't think this damages his legacy. I don't think it damages his leg legacy because I think he has a lifetime pass for obviously The Godfather yeah. and The Godfather 2 and Apocalypse Now and The Conversation. Uh, that said, in our lifetimes, he has not been a really relevant filmmaker in terms of like the movies he's made. So. No, but like you said, I think he can just dine out on his earlier work. If, if you made The Godfather... For and the godfather 2 and apocalypse now you could just basically do nothing for the ever and you're fine those are three yeah. of the greatest movies ever made so so but i mean you know who's to say what went wrong with megalopolis everything let me ask you a question that i had i woke up in a sweat the other day thinking of this what if he gets best director nomination in the fifth slot the branch is 150 people right well, he does have a lot of, of his friends stumping for him. All of them. Uh, so many filmmakers. It, name a top filmmaker. They've talked about it. Spike Lee, Steven Soderbergh, Spike Jones, uh, down the list. Todd Phillips. Many, they're, at, they're at all the Q&As. Many of these people are carrying the water for the movie. What a swing. What a, Even if it's, they don't, none of them are saying it's good. They're just like, what an achievement. It's that kind of stuff. I'm like, I really was thinking this the other day. I was like, what if he gets in? Because th that is not, again, another category that has like a lot of flexibility. There's no big names this year. So what if it's like a two Leslie thing at the end of the day where it's like, oh, you know what? I'm going to definitely put Francis in and then I'll fill out the rest. And if enough big name filmmakers maybe do that, does this become like one of the most crazy Oscar nominations we've seen in 150 years? I mean, I do think it, it matters that they're not specifically talking about the quality of the film because that is what you had with the two Leslie campaign. And like, that is a solid movie with a great performance by Andrea Riseborough. It was just that like film Twitter was combative about it because they, it wasn't on their radar until the last or that voting week in January. They, they didn't know? want to embrace the, small they didn't want film. to entertain, you know, <laughs> they don't want to embrace a small film with a giant heart choice. Yeah. But yeah, I think like I think this if there is like a campaign for him or like a ground twelve support, like it's really again just like dining out on his legacy and his name. You know, it's not and I but I think it matters with that branch about actually liking the work. Like I, how many of them yeah. do you actually think have seen the movie I, I, and I don't liked it? Know. I don't know. <laughs> I, I really don't know. And I'm like, I haven't even seen it yet. I I, I don't know if you have it. either. And like uh, I do want to see it, but it was like not I never got invited to one screening. Not that that matters. I don't give a shit. They don't invite me to anything. But I also never got to see it in the movies. And now I'm just like, I guess I'll watch it on TV just like he he expected. Um, But yeah, I don't know. It would not like the movie is not getting anywhere else. But I just was like, what if the branch gets him in? 
I don't think it's impossible, at least I would say. No, I think it it matters that like it still has to be good, the right. movie. Okay, itself, I understand. And they still have to yeah, yeah. like it. Right. So right. I don't think he can coast just on being Francis Ford Coppola. Yeah. Okay. Thank that makes me feel a little better after waking up nervous. About this it. is what you do. Like you just you think of something, something pops into your head, and then you believe it. That's how you got to go through life, I guess, right? This one's from Mike Joyce, the Game Master. No game. Wow. It's been so long. Hi, Joyce and Chris. It's me again, Mike. Once again, thanks for responding to last week's email. We could talk about Joker 2, Foley, Abba Dabba Doo, but perhaps other listeners have already asked about that, and you may have weighed in. So I won't introduce that as a talking point. I don't think they have, but we might have one coming up, so... All I can say is that I'm joining the chorus of the overwhelming majority who did not like the movie, to put it kindly. Just listen to Lady Gaga's Harlequin album on repeat if you want to spend 138 minutes on Joker content. Anyway, it was recently announced that Abbott Elementary and It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia will have a crossover episode. Wow. I can't wait. I love TV crossovers, even if it doesn't make sense at times to merge two worlds. I know that it's a gimmick that networks do, but I always get a kick out of it anyway. In celebration of this upcoming event, I want to ask what your favorite TV crossovers are. Feel free to name as many as you want. Mine would be The Wizards on Deck with Hannah Montana, and that's So Sweet Life of Hannah Montana on the Disney Channel, Lilo and Stitch and Kim Possible, and Brooklyn Nine-Nine and New Girl. Also, Joyce, feel free to weigh in on Dr. Odyssey Episode 2 Singles Week. I had no idea Shania Twain would guest star, and I love that she was not playing herself. Wow. I can't well, wait for the Shania next... was announced. So. Okay. I can't wait for the next episode, Plastic Surgery Week. That's all for now, and have a great day. That's from Mike. Um, Dr. Pacey, yes, on tonight as we're recording. Third episode. So yeah, every week is themed. Just I everything about the show was perfect. But I realized with the second episode, um, one of my issues with the show is is that I think they're trying to do too much in one episode. And if, at first, I thought it was just like a pilot thing where you know, like it's overstuffed and trying to show him like doing all these cases uh, and everything. But the same thing happened again in the second episode, Singles Week, um, and. I feel like they should just do like two cases max because the the team is not big enough for most. This is not ER, you know. You can't have like, like A, B, and C stories and like multiple cases. So I feel like they need to do like two cases max an episode. Do you think that's like? I've been thinking a lot about the OC always, but also because the Mets are going to California. California, here we come. Yes, and I'm like obviously thinking of the OC. Have texts from friends with the fucking credits and the meme. And I'm I was so glad, like, like oh. that that series is going five. Yeah. And I was like, oh, uh, like the OC, the first season was great because it was just, what if we did every single thing we ever thought of? And then by the time you got the second season, it was like, oh shit, we got to do another one of these. And then you think Dr. Odyssey is like doing that where it's like, what if we don't get it? Let's just do this. Like we're not getting another season, basically. They're, they're going to get another season. I know, but I'm like, it seems like <laughs> they're not, right? Like maybe that's the, like if they're just doing too much, maybe it's like save some of these for like season two. Yeah. So I'm just like, you know, just like save, save some cases. But it, it yeah, because he just has a team of three. I'm like, guys, come, this is not a county general here. But I'm, anyway, my favorite crossover, I haven't even seen this, but it's Bones and Sleepy Hollow. And at my previous job, uh, we all called it Sleepy Bones crossover. Great. Yeah. I can't, I can't top that. I'll just say one more thing about Dr. Odyssey. Uh, on the way to walking to, to school this morning, came up unprompted by another another friend. So this show is, is sweeping, the, sweeping the nation, Joyce. Uh, the best. I don't have a TV crossover. I don't, can't think of any, honestly. <laughs> like, I like, remember well, the Well, usually, like, like, TV crossovers, like, make sense, right? Yeah. So, like, 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 Sleepy Bones, like, does not make sense. And, like, Abbott and Sonny also kind of does not make sense. But, yeah. you know. Uh, this one's from Chuck. We mailed us at slugfest at goldderby.com. First time emailer. Love those. Hi, y'all. Read last week's conversation about fixing the best original song category at the Oscars. My not fully thought out take is that nominees should be restricted to diegetic songs in the movie acknowledged by the characters. Basically, it should be treated like a true craft category, judged on how well the song contributed to the film's overall success, rather than this one-off Grammy Award on a night otherwise focused on movies. For example, in That Thing You Do, the song of the same name has to actually be catchy Which and good. Which should have won. Otherwise, the rest of the movie falls apart. Being able to take written lyrics, the suggestion of a song into script and turning it into something that works within a movie is a cinematic skill that should be rewarded. To further clarify my view on this, allows uh, this allows for my view on this allows for the inclusion of musical numbers. I'm just Ken, 
serves to advance the plot of the film and the character arc so it fits the ethos but obviously cuts out end credit songs or songs that just play in the background to go back to barbie what was i made for plays over a montage it could easily replace with another similar sounding dirge if not a cinematic achievement let me know what you think even if there are holes in implementation implementation concerns this is most is this directionally correct um i support that like i think the song being diegetic is important and um i think is uh a component that a voter should take into account when they're voting for the winners too. Um, I guess it's probably like most films don't have diegetic songs. You right. know, that's the thing. I you I know? actually think my thing would be, I would like, you don't want to add categories. I get it. I, I think best song it's best. Like there should actually be best song because I think like it, you could use a song. Best really song well versus best original song. It should just be best song. And it's any song in the movie. And it has to be within the but movie. But wouldn't that just be like best music supervision? It should be then. And then he goes to the music supervisor. I would be totally fine with that. I don't think there's not enough songs, I don't think. And too many of these songs that get nominated are not part of the movie. And they actually don't really care that it's part of the movie or not, yeah. as we've seen. But like, so as long I'm as like, they like the song or they're just kind of lazy about it. And So it's like if it was just best song, then it opens it up. You could give the award to the music supervisor. You don't give the songwriter a song, uh, an Oscar, fine. Sorry to Diane Warren. Uh, maybe she could get into music supervision. And then uh, you just give that award out. I, I just think that's a better way to do it because then at least it's like, it could account for original songs, sure, or diegetic songs, but it also could just account for like, oh my God, I can't believe what a great use of that song was. Yeah, like the Emmys have, you know, original song, like or music and lyrics as it's yes, called. Yes. And music they also have music supervision. So I that's mean, I how do... like Stranger Things won like for yes. Kate Bush. You know? I would I would actually do both, but if you want to not add a category, because I know that's like a thing, then it should just be best song. But this is not wrong. Chuck is on the right track, I think. Yeah. I think like if you if you just limit it to diegetic songs, it would just be a lot of uh musicals, like um and animated films, because they're well, usually singing those songs. And then yeah, like any like a a, a music based film that's not a musical you know that you need to write an original song for when when they invented this category don't you think that's what they were thinking of more than like diane warren writing well musicals song? also used to be way bigger back right i'm just saying like it's like we're talking about like it's like this happens a lot in the in the world choice and in just in general we make rules 80 100 200 years and ago and things change and then we're still following those stupid rules i can yeah. think of one thing that i am always like let's get rid of it but we don't need to get political on here uh, this one from Jonathan who wrote back to back weeks and he's back for a third time. How long is this one? Not that long. Okay. Hi, Joyce and Chris. Happy third week of mailbag episodes. Thank you, Chris, for my, co for complimenting my flow of questions and gladiator to an avatar to uh, way of, avatar way of water comparison last week. This week, my questions are this. Now that Joker for only ado, which I've seen and quite enjoyed for the most part has been out in theaters for a week. With the brutal audience and critic score and reviews and disappointment at the box office, not to mention the degrade on Cinema Store and the half star on post tracks, is the film destined to be nominated for multiple awards at next year's Raspberry Golden Raspberry Awards? Just like with presumed Oscar contender Hillbilly Elegy, could it receive the same exact three nominations? Worst director, worst screenplay, worst supporting actress. Gun Close should have never received that nomination. I believe this could happen and that it could also receive nominations for worst screen combo and worst remake, ripoff, or sequel. Both The Hangover Part 2 and 3 received nominations for worst remake, ripoff, or sequel. So Todd Phillips apparently doesn't know how to make sequels. Pity. However, I don't think it'll receive the nomination for worst picture, which is what happened with the recent films Hillbilly Elegy, Dear Evan Hansen, and Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantum Mania. Three films that received multiple nominations but not a nomination for Worst Picture. With that said, Joker 2, nor any film is beating Razzie frontrunner Madam Webb, which probably win all the categories it will be nominated for, while Borderlands and Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey 2 will also receive multiple nominations. It's funny how there is more serious frontrunner for Best Picture at the Razzies than at the Oscars, since between three films, Brutalist, Enora, and Amelia Perez. Also, do you think Deadpool and Wolverine will pull a Spider-Man No Way Home by receiving a single nomination for Best Visual Effects? Both films exceedingly smashed at the box office, but the past two previous entries from both franchises didn't receive any nominations. I think it could happen since Disney is pushing hard for it, and also Furiosa, Mufasa, Twisters, and Wicked, and many other films are not as locked in. Dune Part 2, King of Planet 8, and Gladiator 2 are essentially the only films guaranteed for a Best Visual Effects nomination, and only Ann Thompson of IndieWire is currently predicting it to be nominated, which I find interesting. Thanks again for taking my questions. Keep up the good work. Um, Didn't Winnie the Pooh win already? Uh, 
This is oh, did I say it was it's the sequel, Joyce? There's a Blood and Honey 2. Okay. Because so. I was like, I thought Blood and Honey. No, no, it's Blood and Honey 2. Okay. I apologize. Um, I mean, I don't follow the Razzies at all. But I don't take that shit seriously. Sorry. Yeah. Like but sounds I right. see like the I, I see like the winners when they're announced. Yeah. Whatever. But all, all that sounds right to me. Yeah. Uh I don't even know how they like vote for the winners. <laughs> I didn't I didn't hate Joker too. I didn't love it. I found it it's a good idea and actually a good movie to talk about. I found the execution uh dull in times. I don't think it's getting in anywhere, but I could see Joaquin and Lady at the, Gaga. At the Razzies or the Oscar? At the Oscars, certainly. But I, I could see Lady Gaga and Joaquin getting in at the Globes. I don't think it's like a total washout. And I think it there those categories are not strong. So there you go. I think they would have a better chance of getting at the Globes uh, if it were still the HFPA. Okay. And for visual effects, I was not super impressed personally with Deadpool and Wolverine at all. But I guess it could get in. I don't have it in myself. I don't have it in either. Um, I think that's definitely its best chance for a nomination. Um, But I don't think like the like the visual effects in that movie are not talked about in, in the same way as some other recent yeah, Marvel yeah. films, you know yeah. what I mean? What if Deadpool and Wolverine gets in for adapted screenplay? Well, then you would just jump off a building. No, I don't care. Let them nominate anything they want, even dumb stuff. Uh, this you one is that from... movie so much, and I'm like, that movie was totally fine. <laughs> this one is from Luke. Uh, email this is com. Hi, Joyce and Chris. Luke here from Singapore. Heard of this tiny island where Crazy Ridge Agents was sent in? First time emailing, though, and I've been joining the podcast for years. A question in each category. I recently started watching Pachinko on Apple TV, and I really love it. How can a show of this caliber not get any enemy love? Surely at least supporting actress nom for the incredible Yu Young Jin. Uh, is the show not eligible, or could it make an Emmy comeback for the great season two, a la The Gilded Age? Number two. Does Wild Robot stand a chance for Best Picture now? It might be my favorite movie of the year animated and the best animated movie I've seen in a long while. And this question is for fellow tennis fan Joyce. You're one of the few movie TV tennis enthusiasts like myself. My all-time favorite player is Martina Hingis. Wondering what you think about her and who you are your all-time favorite players and any memorable matches you remember fondly. Also, I'm so excited to be going to the Australian Open next year. Have you ever been? I know wow. you're a regular at Flushing Meadows. Sorry for the long email. This take it as four years worth of emails. The next one will be short or keep up the great work. That's from Luke. Wow, Luke. Um, I hope you have a blast in Melbourne. Um, no, I haven't been to any of the other three yet. So uh, like the Wimbledon queue scares me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to participate in that. But um, I love Martina Hingis. I was very sad when she retired in 2002 because of uh, foot issues. And then she came back in 2006. So I was very happy about that. Um, and I saw a couple of her matches uh, uh, when she returned uh, then. And yeah, I always loved her game because it was so geometric and she wasn't a power player at all. Um, and her Aussie final against Jennifer Capriotti, uh, iconic too. And I, I, I love her uh, one long sleeve kit, one short sleeve, also iconic. Um my favorite players, um, I I love the big four. I love a lot of players. I love Delpo. I don't really hate any players. Um, the women, like I I prefer like the crafty players over the power players, but I love like power play. Like I love Lindsay Davenport. The way the ball sounds off her racket, her ground strokes were crisp and perfect. Um, and yeah, I know memorable matches. Um. Well, one of my favorite ones that was at for the entire thing was when Delpo came back from two sets down against Dami at the 2017 U.S. Open on grandstand because he was sick. And I was like almost ready to leave because it seemed like he was about to lose. But then he came back from two sets down and it was great. Um, but but yeah, today, as we're recording this, uh, Rafael Nadal announced he was retiring. So very sad day. I don't remember the other questions. Pachinko at the Emmys. Oh yeah, Pachinko. Maybe. Um, I think we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Then we get a question about this. I think so. Uh, I think it's just underseen. It's definitely it's eligible. 
<laughs> it is eligible at the Emmys. Um, and it's not a it's not a show that is bingeable. And I think that's one of the issues. Like it's a very good show. I have not watched the second season yet, but I watched the first season and I watch that on screeners. And usually when I watch screeners, I can just blow through screeners and like finish the whole season if they give the whole season that day. But like that's a show where you like you need to take a break. Yeah. And I and I think nowadays a lot of people like things to binge. I'm on a second screen, it's easier to watch. Yeah. You need to pay attention to this show. Uh, the other question was about Wild Robot, but we have another one Wild Robot one here, so I'm going to fold it in. This is from Alex, who's emailed a bunch. Hi, Joyce and Chris. Writing this on the train from D.C. to Baltimore on Monday night with the one Wild Robot score playing in my ears. Chris, my partner, and I saw this movie on Friday night before I listened to your last mailbag on Saturday, and I agree, we agree that one Wild Robot absolutely fucking rules. The score is magic, and at this point in the season, to me, should be not only be locked in for a nomination, but a win. Who knows what Lin-Manuel Miranda is going to bring with Mufasa or what Moana 2 has in store. But I doubt either will have a true cohesive quality score and a rather standout song or two. And speaking of songs, I feel like a standout song hasn't picked up steam yet this season. It's so weird compared to last year when we knew Barbie was going to win in July, and it was just a matter of which song. With that, I feel Marin Morris could have a real shot at a nomination with Kiss the Sky. Aside from fitting well in the movie, that would be such a great live performance, too. I haven't been this impacted by a film score since Babylon. I'm still pissed, wow. by the way. The consistent motif that pops up everywhere is really brilliant work by Chris Bowers. The scene of Roz running with her arms outspread with Bright Bill on her shoulder with the strings on I Could Use a Boost ripping in the background had me absolutely weeping. That moment is burned in my brain and may be the most memorable clip of the year for me, for sure. Uh, one last thing on Wild Robot. I think the film has proved that voice acting needs to find some avenue into the Academy Awards. Yes, understanding that stunts, etc. also need to be in the conversation. I listened to the Vanity Fair interview where Lupita Nyong'o mentioned that when she went into a calorie deficit in order to connect to the mentality of a mundane robot, and that she also injured her voice to the extent that she was on vocal rest for five months at the risk of needing vocal surgery. If that's not commitment to the craft that deserves recognition, I don't know what is. Also, I want to shout out Stephanie Shu. Uh, it's like the creative team said, hmm, who can play uh, a sultry and sadistic so convincingly uh, and cohesively and landed on Jobo uh, Topaki from Everything Everywhere. Stellar casting that I can't get out of my mind. Okay, enough about One Wild Robot and time for your favorite topic for me, Wicked. Chris, what happened? We were allies for a while and now you've bumped Wicked off completely unless you changed in the past four days. I understand it's hard to keep it on the list when other films are actually debuting and performing well, but I still think people are underestimating its potential. I think it was a brilliant move to make Ariana supporting, as I think she has a very legit shot now, and those who know the show know that Act 1 is really focused on Elphaba's arc, and I can honestly see them swapping the, can swapping the campaign excuse me, for the second film, since Glinda really gets to shine emotionally in Act 2, where the story shifts focus on how Elphaba's fleeing has impacted Glinda's life. Wouldn't it be fun to get multiple child TV actors turned pop stars into Best Supporting Actress? Uh, grateful for the individual mailbag episode. So I can submit such long, obnoxious emails every week. I've had these on my mind for two weeks and finally had time to sit down and compile them. Plenty more to come next week after we see Saturday Night and The Substance this weekend, as well as Brace wow. for a slew of TV premieres. Best as always, that's from Alex. Um, a lot going on there. Um, One Wild Robot. Fantastic movie. I, I I think I have I have a winning score, or I think I have an in for score winning song. I definitely think it could get in for adapted screenplay. I'm not kidding. I really do. And I think it's a legit... I mean, animated films have gotten screenplay nominations and before. And I think it'll definitely get in for animated, obviously. And I do think it's like a Dark Horse Best Picture contender. I actually think it'll get a PGA nomination. I think it could. we could have two animated movies in PGA. I think Inside Out and Wild Robot could get in. Um. Yeah, I, I think it's definitely in the conversation for Best Picture at the Oscars um you know it'll be the first non Disney or Pixar animated yeah, film yeah, to yeah. get in which would be huge that'd be cool so love to, see, love to see history made yeah uh I do agree voice acting should be more considered I don't know how you do it but yes I think Lupiniago is fantastic in the movie and she's a great. I don't know actor. how it will be considered unless you make it a category. I think you'd have to make it its own category, but she, it is one of like in like the uh, uh, the Hall of Fame voice performances, animated movies, where it's like 
uh, Ellen DeGeneres and Finding Nemo and stuff like that. And like Steve Carell's Gru, who I actually think is great. I think this is like in there. I think she's like so good. I this. mean, one of the best things BAFTA ever did was nominate Eddie Murphy for Shrek. Another great one. So. Uh, and Wicked Choice. Well, I mean, I'm out on it for Best Picture, but I'm ready to put it back in. You know I am. I'm all about this. Yeah, movie. I don't know why you're surprised he dropped it because he changes things all the time. I'm waiting to drop Nickel Boys and uh, or Blitz, but I don't want to do it just yet. I want to see Wicked and then drop one of them. Yeah, like sometimes you just remove things because it hasn't been seen yet or you haven't seen yet. And then you have more data on something else. So you and, just have to, you know, adjust. And with those lower tier ones, I know, I think we both have, like Nickel Boys we've talked about, but like has that, the people who love it, it'll have like a high number, like Wicked to me is not a number one vote. Nickel Boys, I think, for some people would be. And I think that's the difference right now. Even though I think Wicked could be on more ballots, let's say. Yeah. Um, Wicked will probably be very popular. Yeah. Is that How a many people solution? do you think know it's part one? Not that a lot. There's two movies. Not a lot. I would say, too, with Ariana Grande, if she's any good in the movie. Uh, again, that category is flexible. so. But I don't think she's going to get in personally yeah i don't know about either of them honestly i think cynthia would have a better shot i also think they take cynthia seriously because she's already got an oscar nomination so she's she's had two right i mean as an actor which is the one uh this one's from gabriel emailed us before hi joyce and chris can you hear the fireworks that's me celebrating the fact that sugar has been at long last renewed I guess they finally worked out Colin Farrell's crowded schedule. Are you surprised that season two will be following a new missing person case while John continues to search for his sister? I was hoping it would focus on the latter completely, but I guess this makes more sense. What are you eyeing to win stunt ensemble at the SAG Film Awards? Sight unseen on Gladiator 2. I think Deadpool and Wolverine would be the most deserving, but it will probably be between Dune and Gladiator. Also, Chris, now that the drafting period is closed, would you care to share your lineup for the Vulture fantasy uh, movie fantasy league? Thanks for reading. I can't wait to hear your review of Blitz. Uh, well, we already did that. Um, a Blitz. Um, very excited about Sugar Season 2. Yes. You didn't even finish Season 1. No. I watched I the just, twist. I just told you what happens. It was great. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, they obviously teed up Season 2 with the the ending. I went, When I watched the finale of Sugar, I was like, this is basically just like Barbie. <laughs> it was, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, I'm totally fine with the UK. So they, they could do whatever they want. So I just want to see more of like, like the alien life. Yeah. More of that planet. They got to pay that off. Yeah. Uh, SAG ensemble, stunt ensemble, sure. Gladiator? Um, yeah. Deadpool, Wolverine, Dune. I mean, last year, you were fave Mission Impossible 1. I would love to know what else is going to get in this year. So I don't know. Those yeah, three like Deadpool can definitely get in. I mean, Deadpool I mean, is great. That's yeah. actually like great stunts. That's the the one the the one or the one or shot is like all stunts. That's really cool. And then the car one. Yeah, really good choreography. And, and then the opening. Bye bye bye. Would you count the dancer as a stuntman? Does that count under stunts? Would you say? In the beginning. Yeah. Why not? I don't know. Like how he's credited. He's probably yeah. credited. Like so, he'll get a certificate when they get nominated. You think that? But the dancer maybe would be a stunt person. Yeah, I guess it or depends on like how much he did besides the dancing. Right. So, uh, and the Vulture uh, Fantasy Movies League, Joyce, I do have a team. It's the gold. But it's called know. Gold Gold Derby Show is the name. So anybody wow. can follow along. All one word. Here's what I picked. I have literally Joe Reed. I'm friend. We're friendly with. I I am and uh, very nice. He runs this whole thing. I have literally not a clue how this shit is scored. He he's explained it many times. There's a I I read it this week and I was like I don't understand. I'll just it, watch it as it happens. It reminds me of a. Uh, uh beetlejuice when like it just reads like stereo instructions it, i cannot it cannot get through here so that said here's what i got i tried to mix box office with oscar movies because last year i think you get points for like money and points for awards so here's what i have amelia perez anora and conclave my thought was one of those three will win best picture so i feel like if i get the best picture winner uh that's good and then i have i'm still here which is a sony classics one and i was like i think this could get like a lot of critical play and maybe some other nominations low-key or regional nominations and then i went box office smile 2 venom 3 
and Sonic the Hedgehog 3, because I think they're all going to make a lot of money. And then my wild card is Y2K, which is an A24 team movie with my gal Rachel Zegler that looks like a lot of fun. And I think could be like a sneaky anyone but you type box office hit this winter as like a counter programming to the bigger movies. Very eclectic. So if you're like, what the hell is this? You also have to like, it. you have to, you can't just pick whatever you want. You have to like build a team with the money, monetary values. So Joe had like set monetary values for these movies. So like Amelia Price, I think was like 15 and you only have a hundred bucks. So you have to like really figure out what you want. Well, to what was like a dollar? Let me see if you could, uh, I wonder if I could look here and see what was there. Probably can't. Uh, I don't know what was a dollar. I think like, I think like I'm still here was a dollar. Like, you know, like those kind of things. They were like the lower, lower tier ones. So, uh, and Blitz, listen to us talking about Blitz on the last episode. Perfectly fine. Yeah. Solid movie. Uh, this is from our old pal David L. Joyce. Got a few more here to read. Hi, Joyce and Chris. It's uh, David L., someone who doesn't chastise Mike for his games. Uh, my first question is, why are you both not taking the Brutalist seriously for SAG Ensemble? The moment I saw this movie, I knew it would get an ensemble film, and given the uh, given the SAG screening period has been extended in recent years since COVID, I could see it getting in at SAG and it has a strong chance to really win. I don't understand why so many people think Amelia Perez could get in an ensemble, let alone win, because only two foreign language features have been nominated in the category in the last few 30 years. Life is Beautiful and Parasite, which are both much more accessible films. You mentioned how there were walkouts during showings of Nickel Boys. Were there any walkouts during Amelia Perez? Because at the screening I was, there were a few. Also, Chris, I'm curious, what did your pal Jordan Hoffman think of Amelia Perez? I was <laughs> reading his take on certain films. Given how Amelia Perez has been getting some negative reviews, it might not be nominated any critics groups except for the dumb social media influencers that have become the mockery that is now Critics' Choice. And my next question is why does Paramount Pictures not have September 5 listed on their FYC website yet? The fact that they have the mediocre musical remake of Mean Girls listed there on the site and not September 5 looks like a freaking joke, given that they've already figured out the category replacement for everyone. If this is as good as I've heard, they better start campaigning for it soon. I'm seeing it September I'm seeing September 5 at the Savannah Film Festival on the 27th. But I also have to ask, does the movie get many scenes outside of the newsroom? I get kind of claustrophobic and bored when movies don't go anywhere outside in one setting. I loved women talking, but I couldn't stand One Night in Miami and Ma Rainey, and I'm glad those two were snubbed. Unlike both of you, I never dropped Complete Unknown from Best Picture or Screenplay, and I had strong faith in it because Jay Cox, who co-wrote uh, Scorsese movies like Gangs of New York, co-wrote it with Mangold. And he could easily get into director because it looks like a subtle category, category, uh, character study and not some baity biotic based on the trailer. I feel vindicated. Joyce, uh, I read your article about the trailer. Uh, I'm surprised you didn't put it back in. I've got it predicted in 11 categories. Why wow. are you both still convinced a small, empty drama like Sing Sing is still going to get in instead? I just found the characters lacking any depth. Love to you both. Thanks as always. Uh, Chris, I wonder how long it'll take you to realize how wrong you are when your ridiculous anti-addiction of Felicity Jones backfires at a later date. Uh, I mean, way too late. He, he already has her back in. So, but then next week we'll have her out. Uh, I didn't, I don't, I don't put anything in after I watch a trailer. I don't, guys, I don't make a lot of moves. I'm very boring. I don't like watch a trailer and I'm like, I got to put something back in or move someone up or out. So I, watch a trailer for complete unknown. Totally fine. I, if it got 11 nominations, I would l actually be shocked. That's like, holy shit, territory. And I will say this, and we've said many times, uh, David uh, does anti-dick movies like Sing Sing, as you could see from this email. I would say, uh, we've said many times, the pa the people who love Sing Sing love Sing Sing. It's their favorite movie of the year. So that is why I will not, not take it seriously. It's uh, going to get uh, number one votes from like hundreds of people in the Academy. While maybe not everybody saw it, people who did really loved it. So I think it's safe for picture and Coleman Domingo adapted screenplay is very weak. So I think it's good there. And we're assuming Clarence Macklin will get in that one. I'm less sure of, but that's it. I think it's definitely, it, there will be more passion for Sing Sing than there is for a complete unknown. That's not a, to say complete unknown won't be good. We don't know anything about complete unknown. We just it's have a, the trailer. We just have a, a teaser unknown. and a trailer right now. It's a complete unknown. Um, I mean, there was so much there. I don't even know. Oh, but. the other thing was, I'll just do this. Amelia Perez. So mm -hmm. uh, no walkouts at New York Film Festival that I saw. And the no. crowd loved it. We we saw it at the premiere last yeah. week. Yeah, the crowd ate it up. Now, that said, the same New York Film Critics Circle members who love Nickel Boys do not like Amelia Perez, it seems. So I have no it's, doubt. That yeah, I think playing. everyone knows it's 
going to be more divisive. But so. it will get in a Critics' Choice and Golden Globe, so I think that's... Fair. Yeah, and then, like, I think we mentioned this last week, or I don't know when, but, uh, like, we we talked to some Netflix people at the party, and they were very pleased with the response yes that evening and like they they know that like not a lot not everyone's gonna love this movie yes. um I, it felt like they were like girding their loins for the new york response yes. and it was mostly positive so they felt good about that it's like we know there are people who never be won over by this film and that's fine like people who just hate musicals or just not or you you might like them but not vibe with this movie but i think they felt emboldened that there were enough people who liked it from the premiere that night a category they could easily, like, or a, a whisper campaign they could easily run is uh, all these fuddy duddy uh, white guy critics don't like it. Like, but you you like it, right? You're not like those guys. They're out of touch. Uh, and I think that could be fine. Um, um, and then the brute, I'm just pulling up my SAG nominations here. I haven't touched mine since September 10th. That was way before I saw the Brutalist. So I haven't touched, like, this is not like, I don't update a lot anyway. And we're going to, we're probably going to do our SAG predictions next week. Yes. Yeah, so let's so, wait on that. Like I, I, like I really... saw the Brutalist on September yeah. 18th. <laughs> I might so. have it in. I don't know. Um, but I did put Felicity Jones back in. Yes, you did. Uh, this one's from Emilio. Email is slugfest at goldderby.com. Hi, Joyce and Chris, my favorite comedy duo. Oh, wait, September 5th. You want... Yeah, I don't know why that's not on their FIC page. Because it's like Mean Girls was on there. Mean um, Girls should get in for Renee Rapp. And then... <laughs> Best supporting actress. She was um, fantastic. I mean, the movie takes place in their newsroom, but I wouldn't say it's it's not like they're just in the control room. Like I never felt like it was just in one set. Yeah, it's not claustrophobic to me. It's either. not claustrophobic at all. It's like it, you're not like watching a a play in a in a theater. No. Uh, Emilio here, email us at slowfestigolderby.com. Hi, Joe and Chris, my favorite comedy duo. I saw the substance a few days ago. It was an incredible experience seeing the cinema with a large audience. I can't stop playing Pump It Up in my mind. Very good movie, and Demi Moore's scene in front of the mirror before going on her date is easily the best scene of the year. Anyway, I wanted to know how, what you thought of the trailer for my most anticipated Christmas movie of the year, Baby Girl. It seems amazing, and I totally understand why Isabel Hubert loved this film. Also, I'm hope taking the nomination of my queen, Nicole. I don't know if it will be released at Christmas here in Argentina, but it better be. Otherwise, I will become the Grinch. Finally, what movies from this year have you not seen that you were most looking forward to? I hope you're enjoying the New York Film Festival. Love you guys. Thanks for making me laugh every week. Bye. It's from Amelia. Wow. Um, I love the Baby Girl trailer. Me too. It looks great. I have Nicole in. I'm in. Volpe Cup. Let's go. I Yeah, I put her in after Volpe Cup. Uh, movie looks great. And in terms of what movies I have It's a Christmas seen movie. That I'm really excited for, that would actually be number one. I think that looks awesome. Yes. I think the, the marketing- plan seems really focused yeah so, I so like i'm very that. excited for baby girl i'm very excited for gladiator 2 uh and wicked those are bigger ones obviously um i'm trying to think what else i don't know yeah y2k I don't know. actually i'd be excited for too yeah i would say baby girl for me and gladiator so yeah all right this one's from Frankie, and it's about uh, Raphael Nadal, Joyce, I guess. So this one's for you. Uh, hi, Joyce and Chris. So this in came a sad, today. <laughs> it's from, it was from literally sent this morning, yeah. Hi, Joyce and Chris. In a sad but un not unexpected news, Rafa announces retirement today. That's two-thirds of the big three now. Plus, Andy also retired earlier this year. Tennis is going to look so different. Joyce, how are you feeling about this? Well... Like they said, not surprising. Um, yeah, we've had a lot of change in the last couple of years in tennis, not just with the big four, um, but obviously also on women's side as well. And not just Serena, but there's a lot of, you know, less famous tennis players to the mainstream who have retired. Um, but yeah, this is an end of an era. We just have Nole left who has said he wants to play through the LA Olympics. Um but yeah, Rafa retiring is not surprising because he's had so many injuries the last two years. And he kind of implied last year in an interview that um, 2024 could be his last season. Um, and he just really wanted to play the Olympics because it was going to be at Roland Garros. And 
he did that. Like he played the French. He had a really tough draw. He drew Sasha in the first round and lost. So that's his only his fourth loss in 116 matches at Roland Garros. Um, and then he, uh, you know, he was a, a torchbearer at the Olympics, which just blew Mike Tirico's mind because he's not French. But it was so great and such a great acknowledgement of someone who's become so synonymous with the city of Paris, um, getting the torch. And he played doubles there with Carlos Alcaraz, uh, which was great. They they, they lost. Um, they didn't make it to the medal rounds, but it was such a great twosome because Carlos has no idea how to play doubles. And Rafa is a great doubles player. He won doubles gold in Rio and he would just yell at him <laughs> to get him the correct position. It was like a dad chastising his child. <laughs> um, and then he lost in the second round to no way. So that closed the chapter on their great rivalry. And he obviously didn't play U.S. Open, which wasn't a surprise because it's on hard courts and that's terrible for his knees. And he was supposed to play Labor Cup. And a lot of people, including me, thought like maybe he would at least announce his retirement then or something. And then they could do a redo of when Raj retired there two years ago and he cried and they held hands and it was lovely. But then he withdrew from Labor Cup. So now today he announced he's going to retire after he plays davis cup next month for spain um so i think that's a a fitting way for him to close his career because his major breakthrough was literally 20 years ago in the davis cup finals in 2004 um it was spain versus u.s and u.s was favored with andy roddick and he was subbed in for juan carlos ferrero who is now carlos's coach Mm -hmm. um and he was just this 18-year-old kid, and he demolished Andy. And that was his arrival. And then in 2005 was when he made his like his real run as a top player. And then he won his first Grand Slam at the French. So, yeah, uh, I'm sad, but I don't know. It's, it's like I was ready for it. Um, so it's not, like, abrupt. But it, it does feel like a part of, like, my like I, I don't want to say childhood but like most of my adulthood <laughs> mm-hmm. is dying because I was like you know almost an adult when he started playing anyway but yeah uh this one's from Rowan Joyce another one that came in last night at slugfest at goldderby.com hi Joyce and Chris how about those Mets you were there I was there Joyce we're recording this Thursday uh on Wednesday uh the Mets beat the Phillies four to one Went to the, the, going to the Grand Slam from Francisco Lindor. One of the great, uh, great players of my entire life is Francisco. When Lindor. are they building the statue for him in front of City Field? I, I like. I'm not even kidding. You're gonna laugh. I was literally like crying watching. I was. I <laughs> love this guy so much. I think he's so good. I've never seen a player so good in my life. Uh, he should be the captain. I can't wait for them to put the C on his MVP. chest. Clearly, have his number retired. Clearly, Hall of Fame player as a Met. Uh, whether or not they win the World Series this year or not. And we'll see who they play, either the Padres or the Dodgers. By the time this is up, I guess we'll know, right? Or is it, no, the game is Friday. No, it's on Saturday. So it's, um, no, it's on Saturday. Is it Saturday? No, it's, it's gotta be Friday. Oh, right? yeah, tomorrow. No, yeah. oh yeah, but the, this is coming out on Friday. Yes. So they'll play while you're watching this. Yes. Or the day you're watching. They'll play on Yom Kippur. <laughs> I'm hoping uh, the Dodgers win uh, because... They, I don't, the Padres are, are a nasty team and I think they match up well against the Mets and the Dodgers are a fraud. We've said that all year. I am uh, anti-Dodgers just because I, they have so many like bandwagon fans and I can't stand yes. it. Um, so we'll see, but I'm very excited. Yes. It was great. Uh, it was a great uh, past two days. Fantastic. So. Uh. And we're going to end here just one more from Judgmental TV fan. Saving the best for last, maybe. They're back. Hi, Joyce and Chris. I saw a tweet the other day after Netflix canceled Chaos that said it was doing irreparable harm to its brand by canceling shows after one season. I don't know how old this person was, but it got me thinking. The younger, younger generation has no concept of what television actually is. Not to go all in my day, but folks should be happy they got a full season. Not that long ago, you could fall in love with the show and it was pulled after two episodes because no one watched it. Rest in peace, Lone Star, a show that had good ratings for today's world. 
and shows were canceled after one season all the time. Rest in peace, Terriers, the greatest TV loss we'll ever know. Sure. And then there was a whole thing about people being shocked that Abbott Elementary and the Bear are releasing yearly. Well, yeah, that is what television is. So I think the real damage here is not that Netflix is canceling shows after one season, but they changed the landscape so much that people no longer know what TV is and how it's supposed to operate. That's from Judgmental TV fan. Facts. <laughs> Spitting fire. Great facts. Like, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I saw a lot of that too after Chaos was canceled. I'm like, you guys, like children, children are speaking here online. Like they just, they just don't know their history. You got, if you're going to live in this world, you you got to know what happened in the world. I, I don't want to say people are dumb. People are just not curious. And then they, they speak with authoritative ignorance. My issue is rarely the general public. It's more with the thought leaders are actually, I think, dumb and or corrupt a lot. So I think you have like, re like, it's like, if you're a regular person, this is just across everything from sports to politics to movies. I'm always like, it's our, our if we're like think, thought of as like people who know what they're talking about in, in this space, at least, it's our responsibility to be honest uh, with people because they'll look to us and be like, oh, but if we're like dishonest or like being foolish or like trying to uh, win points with social media, then you say stupid shit like uh, Netflix shouldn't be canceling these shows. It's bad for the brand or whatever. And then people who are like half paying attention are like, yeah, that's right. And I, that drives me crazy. So I never get mad at people for like being sheep adjacent, right? For following like what people are saying. But I do get mad at the people who are saying because I think they have a responsibility to be more honest. Yeah. Well, I think it's both because I do think there's a lot of normies saying that it's like, like, fuck off Netflix. You're just canceling the show after one season, like just a regular person. And then they're tweet goes viral and everyone is just like this you know and then um uh, but yeah but there are people who are in uh positions of influence um but i think it's also i feel like a lot of people in that position of influence are also younger younger than yeah. us for sure yeah. who yeah. have definitely not lived through yeah. um regular tv broadcast tv and they just know like the past decade um and that's all they know like people just don't google and they just don't like think before they tweet <laughs> yeah. um but yeah like this is not a, a new thing like i'm sorry your favorite show was canceled but this this happened all the time this was just tv after a broadcast season like if, if your show there there are things called bubble shows i don't know if uh the children know about that and like that was all dependent on ratings i like i my, my coworker and i used to do this whole thing like every april like bubble shows like what would get renewed or canceled it was like once upon a time in wonderland you know and like a lot yeah like they said like judgmental tv fans said a lot of these shows had good ratings for now what we will consider good ratings now but back then they were like bad and yes like a lot of shows would be canceled after two episodes like there was like the the playboy club for nbc like 13 years ago and that was their big fall show for the season it was like Eddie Cibrian, like Amber Heard was in it. And like they were promoting that all summer ever since they announced they picked it up to series at Upfronts that May. And it only lasted two episodes. And its ratings, its ratings then, like I haven't looked at, I could look it up right now, but uh, like I am sure its ratings then when it was canceled after two episodes were better than what Abbott Elementary is pulling now. I'm sure that's, I, yeah. So, like, this this was just what happened. Or, like, shows would get canceled, and then they would just burned off their filmed episodes on a Friday or a Saturday. Yeah. It's, uh, you're very lucky now, I think. a lot. They don't know how good they have it, maybe. Yeah, and also, like, I don't understand, like, there are so many people who are also, like, this is why I don't start any shows. Like, I don't start any shows until they're renewed. Like, no, just watch the show. If you want to watch it, watch it. Yeah. Because then, like, these streamers and studio they have data and they know like someone's watching it like stop waiting for something to binge just watch the show if you're interested in it can't disagree <laughs> joyce i think we're gonna wrap it up there
emails at slugfest at goldderby.com. We'll do another mailbag next week. And what, we, what else are we going to talk about next week? Are we going to do our, our SAG picks next week? We could do SAG. I mean, your fave, Anora is coming out next week. I mean, we'll do a little Anora and a little SAG, and then we'll do your email. So email about that. Email about Substance or Wicked, or whatever you want to talk about. One Wild Robot. Always down to read more about that. Uh, I'll talk to you then. Bye, Joyce.